Wala pa ako nakikita, ha? Ah, ay, po. Meron na, na ba? Ito Meron na, na ba? Ito lang po, ito na. Ayan, meron na po. Ayan, nakita ko na. Okay, okay. Okay. Si Sir na lang po ang di ko pa ma... Di ko siya marinig, Sir. Attorney? Attorney? Ayan uh, po. Uh, uh, one, win one minute, two hour, one minute, two hour broadcast po. Just be okay. ready na lang po. Um, Vaughn will say three, two, one and we're live. Para po makapag-start po kayo magsalita. And project your video. Ay, may kino kayo ma'am. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Juan, can we do it now? Ah, sige po. Kaya ko na mag-live ngayon. Hala. Hello, sir. Okay. Okay, okay. Live na book tayo. In 3, 2, 1, yan na po. Okay. Okay. Pwede na po kayo magsalita, sir. Okay, good morning. This lecture is about developments in security regulation code brought to you by Rex Publications. This lecture is intended for law students and bar examinees. Now, you may wonder if this is a good time to talk about issues surrounding money and the flow of money. After all, there's a pandemic. Schools and offices are closed. We are under quarantine public health policy is the top concern and when it comes to the economy the most urgent issues involve what we call the real economy or the real sector as opposed to the financial economy or the monetary sector so the real economy concerns the production and distribution of goods and services in the real economy, you have a producer of commodities and consumer of those commodities. There's a supply side and there's a demand side. Buyers and sellers meet in the market and the price of commodities is fixed. Now, something analogous happens in the financial economy. The commodity is money. There is also supply and demand of money. And there is a price for the use of money. On the supply side, you have savers of funds or providers of capital. On the demand side, you have seekers of capital. Those who supply capital want to move money from the present to the future. They expect future returns. Those who demand or seek capital want to move money from the future to the present. They have the potential to make future profits, so they pay the price or the cost of capital to have the funding now. When the providers and seekers of capital meet, the price of money is fixed. That price is equivalent to the return on investment from the point of view of the provider of capital and is equivalent to the cost of funding from the point of view of the seeker of capital. Once the saver provides the funds with an expectation of a return, he or she becomes an investor. A security, which is our topic, represents this investment transaction. It represents the meeting between the investor and the investor. The financial economy is the lifeblood of the real economy. And in order to fund subsidies and stimulus pack packages during this pandemic, governments issue treasury bills, treasury notes, or treasury bonds. So those are just like war bonds, except we have something like COVID-19 or pandemic bonds. So pandemic financing is going to be a thing Recently, the Pope talked about the reduction or forgiveness of the debt of poor nations. Most of that debt is actually in the form of emerging market sovereign bonds. 
European countries are contemplating the issuance of perpetual bonds or bonds that do not have maturities to fund their pandemic response. The pandemic has precipitated the prices of oil, oil commodity futures to negative. We have also heard about negative interest rates in some jurisdictions, a situation where savers are penalized for saving and the cost of borrowing is very low. And some foreign go governments are already looking at this policy to stimulate the economy. Now, all these things illustrate that during this pandemic, the financial economy affects the real economy and vice versa. Next year in 2021, the London Interbank Offer Rate or LIBOR will be phased out, which means that securities that reference the LIBOR as a benchmark interest rate need to have some adjustment. So imagine a situation where you are an investor expecting a rate of interest and now that rate of interest is no longer determinable. Last year, the Republic Act number 11439 or the Islamic Banking Act was passed and we will probably see more innovative types of securities in the Philippines pursuant to the Islamic principles of finance. The Securities Regulation Code or the SRC is a law regulating the issuance and distribution of securities. Of course, the law is just a set of rules. Ultimately, there is a reason and context behind the law. The particular context of the SRC is the investment context as opposed to the commercial context. There's a solicitation of investments from the public. There's a meeting between providers and seekers of capital. So we only have two hours this morning, so we will begin immediately with SRC Section 3.1. Section 3.1 gives you a definition and list of securities. In fact, we will discuss each and every security. So that's letter A up to letter G of Section 3.1. I will use the discussion on shares of stock to discuss the entire process of securities offering, although this process may be applicable to other types of securities. Now, we are going to discuss the nature of securities because in SRC Section 8.1, a security must be registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, before the security is sold or offered for sale or distribution within the Philippines. There are, of course, exceptions from the registration requirement, but for this lecture, we will focus on the nature of each security in SRC Section 3.1. The first sentence of Section 3.1 gives you a definition of a security. After this, the section gives you a list of securities. Now, I must emphasize that this list is not exclusive. And you know it's not exclusive because of the word including and the last item in that list, item G, which says that securities include other instruments as may in the future be determined by the SEC. Therefore, this list is open-ended. So let us first discuss the definition of a security. Section 3.1 states that securities are shares, participation, or interests in a corporation or in a commercial enterprise or profit-making venture and evidence by certificate, contract, instrument, whether written or electronic in character. This definition can be broken down into three elements. One of the most common questions in law examinations involves the determination of whether an instrument is a security. So in order to answer that question, you need to be able to state these three elements. As a, as a minimum, therefore, you need to memorize these elements. So rec recall our discussion earlier about the overview of the financial economy as the meeting between the providers of capital and the seekers of capital. So this is done in an investment context. And the first and second elements in the definition of a security represent the investment context. The first element, shares, participation, or interests, refers to the infusion of capital, whether in the form of debt or equity, by the saver or investor in the investee, with an expectation of return on that capital, whether in the form of interest, dividends, or capital appreciation. In other words, the first element talks about the cash flow structure of the investment, Moreover, the first element refers to the supply side or providers of capital. The second element, 
corporation or in a commercial enterprise or profit-making venture refers to the investing, the demand side of the investment process or the seekers of capital. This second element is worded very broadly. It is not limited to a particular legal form. It's not limited to stock corporations or partnerships. The words commercial enterprise and profit-making venture mean that you don't need to be a particular business organization. In fact, by like saying corporation, you can have a non-stock, non-profit corporation issuing a security. And we know that because in Section 3.1, Item F, membership certificates are considered securities. These are issued by non-stock corporations. So now the third element talks about the form of the security. That form can be a certificate, contract, or instrument. It can be written or electronic. The investee or the seeker of capital is the issuer of the instrument. The saver or investor is the holder of that instrument. In the case of shares, it's the stock certificate and entries in the stock and transfer book of the issuer. In the case of bonds, it's the bond indenture or trust indenture and entries in the register of bond holders. In the case of derivatives, you have what we call the master agreements, the schedules, and the confirmations. There is no limitation as to the form that the security can take. And later on, when we discuss the case of SEC versus Howey, where the Howey test came from, you will realize what we mean when we say that the security can literally take any form. Because in that case, you have a contract of sale involving the real estate coupled with a service contract over the real estate. Now you will ask, how could the real estate sales transaction be a security? Well, exactly, because, the, the, because despite being just a sale of property, the court concluded that the security was involved. And we will go into that under investment contracts in Section 3.1, Letter B. There has to be a fundraising, capital financing, or a capital raising activity. This is distinguished from trade financing and consumer financing. In the United States, courts will always try to distinguish whether there is a commercial context or investment context. Trade financing and consumer financing are done in a commercial context rather than investment context. We will elaborate on this when we get to notes in section 3.1, item letter A. Now, another point about the definition. We must first distinguish between uh, an instrument which is not a security as opposed to an exempt security. So an exempt security is still a security. It's exempt from the obligation to register that security with the SEC. One example is a treasury bill, treasury bond, or treasury. These are government securities, and these are exempt securities. And with that, let us proceed to the list of securities. So section 3.1, letter A, first item is share of stock. There's a reason why share of stock and bond are the first in this long list of securities. Shares and bonds are the paradigms of what a security is. You cannot mistake them for anything else. Shares represent ownership or equity. Bonds represent debt or obligation. Shares of stock contain a bundle of rights, control rights, and economic rights. Control rights are manifested through voting rights. Economic rights include dividends, liquidating dividends, and through the free transferability of shares, capital gain. There are several types of shares of stock. A common share of stock is a share with full voting rights. A preferred share of stock has limited voting rights. Moreover, the preferred share has a stipulated dividend rate. In other words, you can know more or less in advance expected dividends on a preferred share. Now, in a cumulative preferred share, the cumulative characteristic has something to do with the accumulation of dividends. Let us say that we are looking at a three-year investment horizon. The promised dividend rate is 10% per annum. And let us say that in year one, the corporation is profitable. But for some reason, the directors did not declare dividends. So in year two, profit is still good, but the directors still did not declare dividends. Now comes year three. Finally, the directors declare dividends. Those who hold cumulative preferred shares will now get all the dividends due to them since year one. In other words, on year three, they will get the 10% from year one, the 10% from year two, and the 10% from year three. 
there's an accumulation of dividends from the years where there were no dividend declarations. An accumulative preferred share is the exact opposite. In the example we provided, if there is no dividend de declaration in year one and year two, and there's only a dividend declaration or distribution in year three, and you are a holder of a non-cumulative preferred share, you will not get the dividends pertaining to years one and two. You will only get the dividends for year three. Okay. Now, uh, participating preferred share is a share where the stockholder can obtain dividend distributions on top of the promised dividend rate. So if the promised dividend rate is 5% per annum, it is possible for you to get an additional 3% or 2% or 1% dividends depending on the profitability level of the corporation and again depending on the discretion of the board of directors. So, uh, of course, the dividend policy of the corporation can provide the formula when you are entitled to those additional dividends. The word participating in a participating preferred share has nothing to do with control rights or voting rights. It is a participation to the profits of the corporation on top of the promised dividend rate. It does not mean more voting rights. A non-participating preferred share is one where the stockholder only gets the promised dividend rate and nothing more. A redeemable share is a share that can be purchased back by the corporation. And there are two types of redeemable shares depending on who has the redemption right. Either the corporate issuer has the redemption right. In other words, the issuer is the one who has the right to buy back the shares. Or the stockholder is the one who has the right to sell the shares to the issuer. So, uh, usually the, the redeemable share has a call provision. A call provision is a right to buy the share or it can have a put provision. So, a put, provi a put is a right to sell the share. Now, a convertible share is a share that has a conversion right or conversion option. It can be a right to convert the share to another class of shares. For example, from preferred share to common share, or it can be the right to convert the share to another type of security. For example, from common share to a bond. So I mentioned conversion option. And usually when you, when you hear the word option, you think of derivatives. And derivatives are also in this list of securities. But for purpose of the convertible share, the conversion option is embedded in the convertible share, meaning to say that you cannot trade it in its own right. So this is unlike a warrant where you can detach the warrant and can trade the warrant in its own right. So a conversion option, unless otherwise is stated, it's embedded in the host contract or the host uh, share of stock. Uh, there is a draft uh, memorandum circular right now uh, pertaining to guidelines on derivatives. Uh, so that, that is still a draft, but that draft will make it clear the difference between embedded derivatives and standalone derivatives. So as I have said, you can develop different classes of shares with each class having a unique set of control and economic rights. Uh, you can also combine these different classifications. For instance, you can have a redeemable preferred share. You can also have a non-cumulative, non-participating preferred share. So this is actually, the next slide is just a review of corporation law. Uh, let us discuss the difference between creation of shares and issuance of shares. Authorized capital stock represents the quantum or the number and par value of shares that have been created. It represents the maximum amount of equity capital that a corporation can issue. You can find it in the articles of incorporation. Subscribed capital stock represents the portion of shares that have been outsourced issued and are outstanding. The paid-in capital stock is the actual amount of equity capital that has been received by the corporate issuer. You can create shares through the articles of incorporation through the authorized capital stock, but these shares do not represent actual investments. They just represent the shares that have yet to be issued. Now, you issue shares by having share subscriptions. This is embodied through a subscription agreement between the corporation and the subscriber. Once the subscription agreement has been executed and is in effect, the subscriber obtains the status of a stockholder and the shares covered by the subscription agreement are considered issued and outstanding. In other words, there's an infusion or legally binding promise of infusion of equity capital. 
if the shares have been issued, even though not fully paid, you are generally entitled to control rights, economic rights. But you need to fully pay the issued shares in order to obtain stock certificates. Okay. So now let us say you have subscribed to certain shares. The next step is the recordation or registration of the share issuance in the corporate books. So the corporate secretary will enter the details of the share issuance in the stock and transfer book or the STD. Entries in the stock and transfer book are the best evidence of share ownership. Only those entries in the stock and transfer book are binding to the corporation. After the recording, the corporate secretary will issue the share certificate in your name. So let us say that after one year or two years or three years of being a stockholder, you now want to sell your shares. You can do that through a share purchase agreement or any equivalent contract. So this agreement between the parties is not sufficient to bind the corporation. You need to request the corporate secretary to record or register the share transfer in the corporate books. In the stock and transfer book, okay, the, sec the secretary must record the share transfer, cancel the share certificate in the name of the seller, and issue share certificate in the name of the buyer. So now the buyer has the physical stock certificate. Okay, so that ends our review of corporation law. Okay, so this process of transferring shares happens in private offerings and private offering of shares of stocks and exempt transaction in SRC section 10 point, uh, point uh, section 10 letter, no, sorry, it's section 10.1 letter K. So under section 10.1 letter K, it says, the requirement of registration under subsection 8.1 shall not apply to the sale of any security in any of the following transactions. Letter A, sale of securities by an issuer to fewer than 20 persons in the Philippines during any 12-month period. Okay, so that's private offering. And if you're doing private offering, you will, we will do the, the steps that we described in the last slide. Now, remember that the context of the SRC is public solicitation of investments. And so when it comes to public offering of shares of stock, the first process is underwriting. Underwriting is the process of guaranteeing the distribution and sale of securities of any kind by a company. You have an issuer of the security and the underwriter is in charge of the distribution and sale of that security. Underwriters help issuers of security sell and distribute those securities through their knowledge of the financial and capital markets, through their knowledge of investor sentiment, and through all of this specialized information that they have, they can fix the appropriate price of the security. They are responsible for estimating the demand for the security at a particular price. Now, who can be an underwriter? First, uh, you can have an investment house, and second, you can have a universal bank because, uh, well, a universal bank because under the General Banking Act, a universal bank has the power of an investment house. So it can function as an underwriter. The governing law for underwriting activities is the Investment Houses Law. That's Presidential Decree Number 129. This is supported by the omnibus rules and regulations for investment houses and universal banks. The issuers of security enter into an underwriting agreement with the underwriter. And there are two types of underwriting commitment, firm commitment and best effort. In a firm commitment underwriting, the underwriter will uh, guarantee that all the securities to be, so to be issued will be sold. The underwriter will buy all the shares or security for its own account and has to sell them all to make money. In the best efforts underwriting, the underwriter will only sell as much as it can sell. The underwriter is not obligated to purchase the shares or securities for its own account. So as part of the underwriting process, the underwriter engages an activity called book building. Book building is a systematic process of generating, capturing, and recording investor demand for shares. It's actually a marketing and sales activity. And what happens in book building is that the underwriter meets with a select, uh, selected group of investors 
called the Qualified Institutional Investors in order to test the demand for the security. Hence, that everyone can participate in the book building. Qualified institutional investors consist of certain entities, uh, which are mutual funds, pension funds, banks, trust companies, other investment houses, and other financial institutions. So this is listed in Section 8, Letter A of the Omnibus Rules and Regulations for Investment Houses and Universal Banks. Under Section 8, Letter A of the said Omnibus Rules, 30% of the shares to be distributed through an initial public offering must be distributed through the book building process. Okay. The operative phrase when we talk about book building is testing of investor demand. The underwriter is just testing the market. There is an offer to buy the security, but there is no acceptance yet. There is no consummation of the sale. Payments are not yet made. Deposits on subscription are not yet done. Contracts to sell are prohibited. And that's because, uh, that's because we have not yet registered the security with the SEC under SRC section 8.1. You can only sell and distribute the security once you have filed your registration statement with the SEC and the SEC has declared the registration effective. So take note, registration involves filing and the declaration by the SEC that your registration is effective. It is not enough to file. There must be a declaration by the SEC. Now, under Section 8, Letter A of the Omnibus Rules, the underwriter can conduct the book building after the registration statement is filed, but before it becomes effective. In book building, you only have sending offers. The underwriter cannot yet accept the offers before the effectivity of the registration statement. But the underwriter already has some knowledge about market demand for the security it already knows whether the price for the security is right. Uh, I am discussing underwriting under shares of stock, but actually it is also applicable in other types of securities like bonds. So we now go to the process of security registration under SRC section 8.1. After the corporate issuer engages an underwriter through an underwriting agreement, the next step is to file a registration statement in the SEC. Under SRC section 3.12, so that's section 3.12, the registration statement is the application for the registration of securities required to be filed with the SEC. So in the filing of the application, you must include the preliminary prospectus or what we call the red herring prospectus. So the prospectus contains all the disclosures that must be made by the issuer regarding the security issuance. Eventually, these disclosures are going to be made available to the general public. The prospectus contains all the material information relating to the issuer, the business of the issuer, the risks related to the business, the financial standing of the issuer, the uses of the funds to be raised from the initial public offering, and all other information that will help the investing public assess the viability of the investment. Now, for purpose of filing the registration statement, you are only required to file a preliminary prospectus. So the preliminary prospectus or the red herring prospectus is a prospectus that does not contain details about the price of the shares and the quantum or number of shares to be offered. Uh, and this is actually related to what we discussed earlier under book building. We mentioned that the underwriter can conduct book building after the filing of the registration statement but before the declaration of the effectivity of the registration statement by the SEC. And the reason why you would want to exclude details about the price and quantum of shares of stock to be offered during the filing is because the underwriter has yet to finalize the price and quantum of shares to be offered. The underwriter will have an idea about the price and the number of shares after the book building, which is a price discovery mechanism. So the book building is a price discovery mechanism. Okay. Now, after filing the registration statement, the, no the notice of filing must be published. So it will be seen by the general public. 
Then after the publication, the SEC will review and issue an order of registration. The order of reg registration is a declaration of the effectivity of the registration statement. Once the registration statement is declared to be effective, the securities can now be issued, sold, and distributed. Okay. Now, what if you want to register shares without offering them right away? This is allowed by shelf registration. Under shelf registration, you register the securities, but you do not immediately issue or sell the securities. There are many reasons why an issuer will not yet immediately issue or sell the shares. Maybe the market timing is not yet right. For example, right now, we have a pandemic. So that could be a factor why any issuer planning to have an IPO will postpone, uh, will postpone the IPO to some other time. So when it comes to securities registration, the underwriter has an exposure to civil liability. So I call your attention to SRC section 12.7 in relation to SRC section 56. Okay, so that's SRC section 12.7 in relation to section 56. In 12.7, it says, any untrue statement of fact or omission to state a material fact required to be stated therein or necessary to make the statement therein not misleading shall constitute fraud. Okay, shall constitute fraud. In short, if there is falsity or omission of a material fact in the registration statement, it is tantamount to fraud. Now, correlate this uh, section with SRC Section 56. Section 56 states that any person acquiring a security, the registration statement of which or any part thereof contains on its effectivity an untrue statement of a material fact or omits to state a material fact required to be stated therein or necessary to make such statements not misleading and who suffers damage may sue and recover damages from the following enumerated persons. So in short, a person who suffers damage because of a false or misleading registration statement can sue for civil liabilities. And the persons responsible include, number one, certain persons related to the issuer, such as a director or selling shareholder. Uh, and there is an enumeration in section 56. So please look at that uh, enumeration. Now the second, auditing firm that certified the financial statements, and the third, the underwriter. So take note, the auditor and the underwriter are not part of the organization of the issuer, yet they can be held responsible for a false or misleading registration statement under SRC section 56. This exposure to civil liability is reiterated in section five of the omnibus rules. Okay, after underwriting and security registration, we now go to uh, the third step in the public offering process, the listing process. So the listing process is the process of distributing the shares in an organized exchange. There is only one stock exchange in the Philippines. So the Philippine Stock Exchange or PSE. The PSE is a private organization. It is a private organization, but it has certain rules to be followed. So for purpose of listing, we have the PSE listing rules. Later on, when the shares trade in the PSE, we have the PSE trading rules. So as you can see, to see the bigger picture of the public offering process, it is not sufficient to just read the SRC. For underwriting, we go to the investment houses law. For listing, we go to the rules of the exchange. Okay. So, and there are several modes of listing. Initial public offering, follow-on offering, secondary offering, sub-rights offering, listing by way of introduction, backdoor listing. So an initial public offering or IPO is the first time that the shares will be issued to the public or the first time that it will be listed in the exchange. A follow-on offering is the offering of additional shares of an issuer that has already conducted an IPO. And of course, 
you know that when additional shares are issued, there is a possibility of dilution of control or dilution of the interest of the existing shareholders. A secondary offering is the offering of a block of shares held by an existing investor. And uh, do not confuse follow-on offering from secondary offering. Uh, follow-on offering takes place in the primary market. So a follow-on offering takes place in the primary market, which means it involves the issuance uh, of the security from the issuer to the investor, from the issuer to the investor. Uh, moreover, a follow-on offering dilutes the shares of existing shareholders because additional shares are being issued. On the other hand, secondary offering takes place in the secondary market. So the secondary market, which means it involves the sale by an existing investor to another investor. So in a primary market, you have a movement from the issuer to the investor. In the secondary move, uh, secondary market, you have a movement of the shares uh, from an investor to another investor. So unlike a follow-on offering, a secondary offering is not dilutive. So there's no stock dilution under a second offering. It does not concern the issuance of additional shares. The shares have already been issued. They are just being sold by an existing stockholder in large amounts. So under a stock rights offering, what is being offered is the right to purchase additional shares in a company. The offer is made to existing shareholders. This is different from follow-on offering because under a follow-on offering, additional shares are being issued and offered. Under stock rights offering, only the right to buy additional shares is being offered. The right to buy. So you're not buying the actual shares, but just the right to buy. So this is done through a subscription warrant. A subscription warrant. Okay, listing by way of introduction is an accelerated process of listing shares. It means that the public offering process will no longer be undertaken once the PSE approves the application of listing by way of introduction, the shares are automatically listed in the stock exchange. So the discussion we had earlier about book building process and that entire process of price discovery and determination of IPO offer price is no longer conducted. So there are few instances when listing by way of introduction can be done. We will not discuss them one by one. Uh, I think there are five, uh, five uh, instances. But one instance is when the listing of securities in an exchange is mandated by law. When the listing is mandated by law. So there are various laws, various special laws that require an issuer to go into an IPO. So let me just point uh, out some of these laws. So one example is the Electric Power Industry Reform Act of 2001 or EPIRA, Republic Act number 9136, section 28 of the EPIRA. Okay, under section 28 of the EPIRA, controlling stockholders of small distribution utilities are required to list, to list in the PSE within five years from the enactment of the EPIRA. Okay. Number two, Downstream Oil Industry Deregulation Act of 1998, Republic Act Number 8479, Section 22. So under Section 22 of that law, it says any person or entity engaged in the oil refinery business shall make a public offering through the stock exchange of at least 10% of its common stock within a period of three years from the effectivity of the law for the commencement of its refinery operations. So the third example of a law that uh, mandates an IPO is the Public Telecommunications Policy Act of the Philippines, Republic Act Number 7925, Section 21. So under Section 21, it says, all telecommunications entities with regulated types of services shall make a bona fide public offering through the stock exchanges of at least 30% of its aggregate common stocks within a period of five years from the effectivity of the law or the entity's first start of commercial operations, whichever date is later. So those are just examples of exchange listings for IPOs mandated by law. 
this can be valid grounds for listing by way of introduction. Okay. So backdoor listing occurs when an unlisted company acquires or merges with a listed company that is relatively dormant or with shares that are not actively traded with the unlisted company as the surviving entity, enabling it to ultimately list its shares on the PSE. This usually happens if the unlisted company is not yet qualified in itself to go into an IPO. So imagine this scenario. You are a company that does not yet have a track record for purpose of listing in the PSE. What you can do is you buy another company that is already listed with you becoming a controlling shareholder of the listed company. Uh, backdoor listing is not illegal, but uh, the PSE is not encouraging backdoor listings because it supposedly shows that the acquiring entity does not possess the suitability requirements to qualify for listing. So now that's it for listing. So far we have discussed the underwriting process, the security registration process, and the listing process. The shares are now being traded in the stock market. The trading of shares in the PSE is governed by the PSE trading rules. This would include rules pertaining to market halts, trading halts, trading suspensions, and so on. One trading rule that was in the news recently during the pandemic is the circuit breaker rule. So the circuit breaker rule provides that when the prices of shares reach a certain threshold, for example, share prices fall by 10% or 20% or 30%, the trading of shares will stop in order to arrest further price movements. So during this pandemic, share prices were sharply decreasing. So the circuit breaker was triggered. Another, another trading rule is the freezing of security prices. The PSE can freeze the price if the price reaches a certain threshold. Unlike the circuit breaker rule, a security price freeze still allows trading to go on, but you can only trade at those frozen prices. So you can still trade under a frozen price uh, rule. Now you may ask, doesn't this violate the free market principle? If you read SRC section 2, one of the policy is to have a free market. But notice that the complete phrase, okay, the, con the complete phrase in section 2 is free market that regulates itself. So the PS is a private organization and the market participants agreed to those trading rules. So it's not really a violation of the free market principle. The circuit breaker rule and the freezing of security prices are not true exceptions. They're not true exceptions to the free market principle because these are not imposed by the government. So there is, okay, there is, however, a provision in the SRC that appears to be a true exception to the free market principle in SRC section 2. This exception is in SRC section 36.1. So in section 36.1, government has the power to suspend trades. If the suspension period is up to 30 days, the SEC can order the suspension of trading. If the suspension period is 30 to 90 days, the president of the Philippines can order the suspension of trading. The maximum period of trading suspension imposable by the government is 90 days. So now the parameter for the imposition of trading suspension is if it is necessary or appropriate for the protection of investors and the public interest. The government power to suspend trading is summary in nature. Okay, next question. Uh, what is the underlying mechanism in which shares are being traded? What is the underlying mechanism in which shares are being traded? The trading of shares in the stock market is done through scriptless trading, which means physical stock certificates are not being exchanged. Under the revised corporation code, and based on our discussion earlier regarding the transfer of and sale of shares of stock, you know that the seller's physical stock certificate will be cancelled and the buyer's stock certificate will be issued by the corporate secretary of the corporate issuer. 
So the mechanism for scriptless trading involves, number one, uncertificated securities, number two, the book entry system, and number three, the process of lodgement. So they are all related. SRC section 43, okay, section 43 allows uncertificated securities. The first sentence of section 43 is, notwithstanding section 63 of the corporation code, of the Philippines. Section 63 of the Corporation Code pertains to the issuance of physical stock certificates. Now, SRC Section 43 qualifies the Corporation Code. You can issue uncertificated securities when it comes to securities registered under the SRC or listed in an exchange. So now you recall the third element of the definition of a security. It can be written or electronic. In this instance, an uncertificated security can be an electronic record. SRC Section 43 allows what we call the book entry system. You can transfer uncertificated securities through book entries held by securities intermediaries. Now, let us try to... Now, let us try to imagine how this takes place. You have this chart. You have this chart which shows how you move away from physical stock certificates to uncertificated securities. This process is called the lodgement process. You are lodging shares. First, you have the corporate issuer. Share issuances and share transfers are recorded in the stock and transfer book of the issuer. Physical share certificates are also issued by the corporate issuer to the stockholder. Next, the stockholder delivers the stock certificate to a securities intermediary, like a brokerage firm. The brokerage firm takes possession of the physical stock certificates and then deposits the stock certificate with the Philippine Depository and Trust Corporation, or PDTC. It is a private organization duly licensed to act as a securities depository under the SRC. It also has its own rules called the PDTC rules. So PDTC rules. Just like the PSE listing rules and the PSE trading rules, the PDTC rules are rules promulgated by a private organization. Now the PDTC receives the security by way of deposit. The PDTC has a wholly owned subsidiary called the PCD Nominee Corporation. What the PDTC will do after receiving the physical stock certificate is to go back to the issuer or to the transfer agent of the issuer. The transfer agent is an agent of the issuer which is in charge of recordation of share issuances and ownership. So in ordinary corporations, you have the office of the corporate secretary. But in very large organizations, they may need to outsource this function to a transfer agent. Okay, and now, now when the PDTC goes back to the issuer or the issuer's transfer agent, the PDTC will request the recordation or registration of the legal title of the shares in the name of PCB nominee. The issuer or transfer agent will record in the books of the corporation, in the stock and transfer book, that PCB nominee is the holder of the shares of stock. So the PCB nominee becomes the legal title holder, the legal stockholder, as far as the issuer is concerned, as far as the corporate books are concerned. But this is just the legal title. The PCB nominee is not the beneficial owner. The ultimate beneficial owner is the stockholder who deposited the physical stock certificate. So you have a separation of legal ownership and beneficial ownership. This is why when you examine the list of stockholders of publicly listed corporations, you will see PCD nominee as one of the largest stockholders. The PCD nominee does not beneficially enjoy voting rights and economic rights. The beneficial ownership rights are passed on back to the issuer. The PCD nominee holds the shares in trust for the stockholder who deposited the shares in the depository. This is all coordinated through the brokerage firm. Once the PCD nominee has legal title to the shares, 
electronic information about the shares are then downloaded and uploaded in an electronic bookkeeping entry system. And this information are shared with a settlement and clearing agent. And the settlement and clearing agent uh, that we have right now in the PSE is the Securities Clearing Corporation of the Philippines, or SCCP. It's another private organization. So the Securities Clearing Corporation, being a settlement and clearing agent, is responsible for ascertaining and implementing the record of transfers of scriptless shares in the PSE. The Securities Clearing Corporation keeps a record of all the trades in the PSE, makes sure they are correct, and makes sure that scriptless shares are being correctly and accurately delivered. So remember, these are all now in electronic form, and it is done through the bookkeeping entry system authorized under SRC Section 43. So now you have a complete picture of the lodgement process. We have seen how to transform a physical stock certificate to a scriptless security. The physical stock certificate is lodged with a PDPC, and information about the shares is converted into electronic bookkeeping entries, which are then traded as scriptless shares. The ownership of the scriptless shares can change because they can be traded in the stock market. But as far as the books of the corporate issuer are concerned, EC denominee remains to hold the legal title. So the legal title does not change while the beneficial owners keep changing. This is why when you see the PC denominee in the list of stockholders, it indicates that the shares held by the PC denominee are beneficially held by the general public. It's called the public float or the portion of shares of a company that are publicly traded through the exchange. So now there's another chart that I want to show you. When the scriptless securities are being traded in PSD, the Securities Clearing Corporation acts as the central counterparty. The central counterparty. So recall that the Securities Clearing Corporation is the settlement and clearing agent. It is responsible for affecting the actual delivery of shares being traded. So to do that, it must act as the central counterparty, meaning to say for all sellers in the stock market, it acts as the buyer, and for all buyers in the stock market, it acts as the seller. The sellers and buyers, of course, do not directly participate in the trading process. They just send trading orders to their respective brokers, and the brokers are the ones who will interact with the PSE's trading infrastructure. The Securities Clearing Corporation keeps a record of all trades and then it shares this record with the PDPC, which is your securities depository. And this is how the record of beneficial ownership of the scriptless shares is being updated in the book entries of the depository. Okay, so that's it for the lodgement process. And that's it for the entire process of public offering of shares of stock. Okay, so isang oras na yata tayo, isang security pa lang discuss So, don't worry, we will not uh, spend one hour for every security. The next security is bonds. So, under, sec uh, under section 3.1, letter A, item 2, bond is a debt security which represents an obligation. It has four elements, par value or principal, coupon rate and coupon payment, frequency of human payments, and maturity or term. The issuer of a bond is a borrower. The holder of a bond is a lender. The par value is the amount being borrowed. The coupon rate is the stipulated interest rate. The frequency of coupon payments is the time at which the coupons accrue and are paid. It can be annual, semi-annual, quarterly, or monthly, but the most common is annual and semi-annual. The maturity of the bond is the date when the bond issuer is obligated to repay the par value or principal. The bond holder can sell the bond in the secondary market. The selling bond holder can enjoy capital appreciation or capital gain, which occurs if the selling price is more than the acquisition cost of the bond. So yes, it is possible for bonds for the prices of bonds to fluctuate. If market interest rates rise, the price of the bond goes down. If market interest rates fall, the price of bond goes up. Market rates and bond prices are inversely related. So think about this. If market 
uh, interest rates rise, that means that the returns or yields of other bonds are more attractive than the current bond that you are holding. So if you're going to sell that bond, it is less attractive in the market. Hence, the price falls. If market interest rates fall, the returns of other bonds are less attractive than the current bond that you are holding. So if you sell it, it is more attractive in the market, hence the price increases. There are many types of bonds. Bond classifications are more diverse than shares of stock. So let me just go over them one by one. Fixed rate bond, otherwise known as plain vanilla bond or conventional bond, floating rate note, Zero coupon bond, perpetual bond, callable bond, putable bond, convertible bond, payment in kind bond, bullet bond, amortizing bond, premium bond, discount bond, corporate bond, sovereign bond, quasi sovereign bond, municipal bond, supranational bond, domestic bond, foreign bond, green bond, sustainability bond, social bond, Islamic bond, investment green bond, junk bond, and there are many terms for foreign bonds depending on the home jurisdiction of the issuer. Panda bond, if the home jurisdiction is China. Maple bond for Canada. Samurai bond for Japan. Kimchi bond for Korea. Yankee bond for US. Matador bond for Spain. Kiwi bond for Australia. So I will not enumerate all the countries in the UN. So you, you get the idea. A fixed rate bond, plain vanilla bond or conventional bond is a bond where there is a stipulated promised coupon rate. For example, 10% per annum. It is the most basic kind of bond. A floating rate note is a bond in which the coupon rate has two components. The first component is the reference or benchmark interest rate. And the second component is the spread. Okay, The benchmark rate is a moving market interest rate. A popular example is the London Interbank Offer Rate or LIBOR which is a collection of published interest rates at which banks will lend with each other. The benchmark rate is variable and depends on market movement. The spread, on the other hand, is a fixed rate that is added to the benchmark rate. So the benchmark rate at a given period can be 3% and the spread is 2%. So the payable coupon rate for that period is 5%. In the next coupon period, the applicable benchmark rate could vary it can go up to 4%. So the coupon rate will be 4% plus 2% or 6%. So now that, that's what makes it a floating rate. Now just a piece of current events, there is a plan to phase out the LIBOR in 2021. So this gives rise to a problem. If the LIBOR is phased out, what will happen to floating rate notes that reference the LIBOR? Usually to address this problem, you have a stipulation in the bond indenture. So the bond indenture is the legally binding document that contains the terms and conditions of the bond issuance. And there is a stipulation on what will happen if the benchmark interest rate cannot be determined. We call this the fallback clauses. There is usually a fallback rate uh, or an alternative benchmark rate in case the original benchmark rate is no longer determinable. The LIBOR is not the only benchmark rate. So there is an SEC issue once on setting up of benchmark rates in the Philippines. So that if you want to read it, we will not tackle it. SEC Memorandum Circular Number 11, Series of 2018, or the Rules on the Administration of Government Securities Benchmarks. Okay, Government Securities Benchmarks. Even though it says government securities, of course, uh, a corporate bond can always reference a government securities benchmarks if uh, they want. Okay, The next type of bond is a zero coupon bond and it is a bond that does not give a periodic coupon payment and is issued at a discount. The interest rate is implicit because of the difference in the par value and the issue price. If the par value is 100 million but the issue price is 80 million, it means the bond was issued at a discount of 20 million. 20 million is an implicit interest. So now we go to perpetual bonds. Perpetual bond is a bond with no maturity date. If there is no maturity date, it means that the bond issuer is not obligated to repay the par value or principal. In short, ito ay utang na hindi nababayaran. And you might ask, what kind of investment is that? Well, for one, to, compen 
to compensate the bond owners for the perpetual nature of the bond, a perpetual bond commands higher yields or higher coupon rates. As a bond holder, you can also sell the perpetual bond. And if you hold the perpetual bond long enough, it is possible to effectively recover the principal amount at some point from the periodic coupon payments. But uh, in reality, perpetual bonds are not literally perpetual because uh, sometimes uh, issuers would include options to buy back the perpetual bond. So it's not literally forever uh, they can exercise the option to buy back the perpetual bond when they already have the funds necessary to redeem the perpetual bond. Okay. So now, a callable bond is a bond that can be bought back by the bond issuer before its maturity. The issuer has the right, but not the obligation, to redeem the bond from the holder before the maturity date arrives. A call is a right to buy. So I mentioned a while ago, perpetual bonds can be redeemed through the exercise of a call provision. So you can actually have a perpetual callable bond. So now, the call provision benefits the issuer. Imagine if you issued a bond at 5% and suddenly the market interest rates drop to 3%. If you are the issuer, you would want to exercise the call so that you can have a bond placement at 3% funding cost rather than to continue paying 5% funding cost on the bond. Uh, the call is a disadvantage to the investor because imagine if the issuer exercises the call, you as the investor suddenly has a reinvestment risk. You expected 5% interest, but now the market rate is now only at 3%. There is a probability that when you reinvest the funds after exercising the call, you will get lower rates from other investment assets. Okay, and the, the opposite of a callable bond is a putable bond. This is a bond that can be sold back to the bond issuer before maturity. The holder has the right, but not the obligation, to have the bond redeemed before maturity. A put is a right to sell. So a put provision benefits the bond holder. So imagine if you hold a bond at 5% and, sa and suddenly the market interest rates increase to 7%. You are the investor, you would want to buy bonds at 7% yields. So you will exercise the put to get out of the 5% coupon bond. And with that, a put provision is a disadvantage, a disadvantage to the issuer because if the investor exercises the put, Issuer needs to have a new bond issuance in a higher interest rate environment, which means higher funding cost. Okay, a convertible bond is a bond that can be exchanged for another bond, a share, or another security. One of the motivations for exercising a conversion option is when you are a lender of a company and that company is on the brink of bankruptcy. You would exercise your option to convert the bond shares of stock in order to gain control of the company. And once you have control, you can influence the way obligations are discharged. Of course, this is subject to corporate governance considerations and limitations under the Financial Rehabilitation and Insolvency Act, or the FRIA. Okay, a payment-in-kind bond or PIC bond is a bond where the coupon payment is not paid in cash. For example, the coupon is in the form of another security. So if XYZ Corporation issues a PIC bond, the coupon payment can be the bonds in ABC Corporation. So you end up holding two sets of securities. Okay, A bullet bond is a bond where the principal amount is payable at maturity date. Okay, The, pay of the principal or the par value is payable at maturity date. An amortizing bond is a bond where the portions of the principal amount are scheduled to be repaid during the life of the bond. A premium bond is a bond where the issue where the issue price is higher than the par value. And a discount bond is a bond where the issue price is lower than the par value. A zero coupon bond is a type of discount bond, but not all discount bonds are zero coupon bonds. It's possible to issue a discount bond, but the bond still pays regular coupon payments. A corporate bond is a bond issued by a private corporation. Okay. A sovereign bond is a bond issued by the national government. So as mentioned, this includes treasury bills, treasury notes, and treasury bonds and are offered through auctions conducted by the Bureau of Treasury. They are exempt securities under SRC Section 9.1, Letter A. Hence, there is no need to register with the SEC under SRC Section 8.1. I encourage you to read the case of 
uh, Banco de Oro versus RCBC, GR number 198756, August 16, 2016. So that's BDO versus RCBC, GR number 198756. We will not discuss it because it is more of a taxation-related case. But there is a brief discussion in that case regarding the public offering of government bonds. With respect to sovereign or government bonds, the mode of public offering is through an auction conducted by the Bureau of Treasury. And this auction is participated in by government securities eligible dealers or GSET. So now you know two types or two modes of public offering. Number one is listing at an organized exchange, and the second one is treasury auctions. There is a third mode, okay? There is a third mode, and it's public placement through the over-the-counter market or OTC market. The OTC or over-the-counter market is bilateral between the parties and is participated in by dealers, brokers, and other intermediaries without the benefit of an organized exchange. So now there are three modes of public offering, exchange listing, auction, and OTC market placement. So if you want to read more about the public offering of government securities, I encourage you to read the following laws. Uh, we won't take them up, uh, but just for your reference, number one, Republic Act number 245 as amended. So that's number 245. Number two, Republic Act number 1000 as amended. And number three, Executive Order number 449 series of 1997. Okay. If you want to read about over-the-counter market placements, please refer to SEC Memorandum Circular number 14-06, January 1, 2006. So that's number 14-06. Uh, these are the rules governing the over-the-counter market. Now, as a quasi-sovereign bond is a bond issued by a government-owned and controlled corporation or GOCC. Others, uh, other countries call them uh, state-owned enterprises. So it is also an exempt security under SRC Section 9.1, Letter A. Hence, there is no need to register with the SEC. A municipal bond is issued by a local government unit. It is also an exempt security under SRC Section 9.1. Letter A. Okay. A supranational bond is a bond issued by a supranational entity or international organization like World Bank and IMF. A domestic bond is a bond issued and offered by a domestic entity. A foreign bond is a bond issued and offered by a foreign entity. If the issuer is a foreign government, okay. If the issuer is a foreign government, the bond is exempt under SRC Section 9.1, Letter B subject to the reciprocity principle. Okay. A green bond is a bond where the principal or par value will be used for environmentally sustainable projects. A so social bond is a bond where the par value will be used for projects with social impact. Islamic bond or sukuk is a bond that is compliant with Islamic banking principles in accordance with Sharia principles. Usually this would entail certain prohibitions. For example, the proceeds of the bond cannot be used to invest in gambling enterprises. Now, this is interesting because one of the prohibitions uh, in an Islamic bond is the predetermination of a fixed rate of interest. And the returns on the bond must be profit-based and not interest-based. The following, we will not discuss the structure of, a, of an Islamic bond, but it is uh, more complicated than the usual. So now the following SEC circulars relate to guidelines in the issuance of green bonds, social bonds, and Islamic bonds. So number one, SEC Memorandum Circular number 9-19, dated April 25, 2019. And number two, SEC Memorandum Circular number 8-19, dated April 25, 2019. So that's number 9-19 and number 8-19. Now, investment grade bonds are bonds with a higher credit, uh, with a high credit rating. This is issued when there is lower risk of default, but of course there are other credit risks. Okay, junk bonds have a low credit rating. This is issued when there is higher risk of default, among other credit risks. So, if you have a low credit rating, you can only issue a junk bond, and when you issue a junk bond, investors would demand 
higher yields. If you have a high credit rating, you can issue investment grade bonds which uh, demand or which warrant uh, lower yields or lower funding cost on your part as the issuer. Now, credit rating is assigned by credit rating agencies like Moody's and Standard & Poor. The SEC can only accredit certain uh, credit rating, rating agencies in the Philippines. I think we have fill rating for bonds. Now, we are done with an overview of the types of bonds. The process of public offering of bonds is, in principle, similar to our discussion earlier about shares of stock. There's also underwriting, building, and listing. And in the case of bonds, the organized exchange is the Philippine Billing Exchange or PDEX. The PDEX is to bonds what the PSE is to shares of stock. But it's also possible to distribute through the over-the-counter market and in the case of bonds through auctions. Now, perhaps what is unique to the public placement of bonds is the presence of a trustee institution who represents the bond holders. In this chart, the trustee acts on behalf of the bond holders. The trustee is in charge of coordinating and centralizing the flow of money between the issuer and the bond holders. The trust indenture or the bond indenture documents the features of the bond, of the, of the bond offering, as well as the responsibilities of the trustee. The trustee must be a duly licensed trans, trust institution pursuant to the General Banking Act. Okay, so uh, now we go to section 3.1, letter A, third item, debenture. A debenture is a debt security unsecured by collateral. So it is a debt security unsecured by collateral. So since it's a debt security, we generally apply the same principle we discussed under bonds. So that's it. So... We now go into notes under section 3.1, letter A, fourth item. Notes are also debt securities, like bonds, they also represent obligations. One common form of a note that you're familiar with is a promissory note. In a promissory note, the issuer promises to pay a certain amount of money to the holder of the note. Okay. Now, I have three examples here and tell me if the following are securities. Example one, a purchaser of a laptop buys from an appliance center on credit and issues a promissory note to secure the sale on credit. Example two, a hospital orders medical equipment from 25 different suppliers on credit and issues promissory notes to each of them to document the hospital's payables to suppliers. Example three, a corporation needs to finance its expansion of operations by soliciting funds from the public through the issuance of promissory notes to more than more more than 100 interested investors. Example one, you buy a laptop and issue a promissory note to the appliance center. Uh, now, this is a mode of consumer financing. And obviously, there is no investment context involved. The appliance center is not investing in you. The, prom the promissory note is just to guarantee that you will pay the purchase price of the laptop. So it's more of a commercial context rather than an investment context. So example one does not involve a security. Now example two, hospital issuing promissory notes to its suppliers. This is a mode of trade financing. Again, the suppliers are not investing in the hospital. They just want to have some guarantee that they will be paid for supplying medical equipment to the hospital. So there's no investment context. It is more of a commercial context. So example two does not involve uh, security. Now, intuition will tell you that example three is clearly a security because it involves solicitation of investments from the public. Now, we have a US case, okay? Uh, and let me caution you that this is only persuasive uh, because we have not adopted it. We have a US case which addresses or which discusses uh, the doctrine on loads. So, Reeves versus Ernst and Young, that's 1990. The Reeves versus Ernst and Young case lays down the family resemblance test when we are dealing with a security identification problem involving notes, so such as promissory notes and demand notes. 
So the family resemblance test is as follows. First, you look at the motivation of the seller and the buyer. Is the, is the seller looking for investment and the buyer looking for profit? Second, uh, look for the plan of distribution of the note. Is it being marketed as an investment, such as a, uh, in a private offering? And third, uh, third, the expectation of the creditor or investor. Do they intend the investment to be a security? And fourth, uh, the presence of an alternative regulation such as the banking loss for banking loans. And in that case, uh, the court gave a list of notes that are not considered securities. So let me caution you again that this is not yet binding to Philippine jurisdiction. It's only persuasive because it's a U.S. case. But it gives you an idea about the principle distinguishing in the investment context and commercial context. So first, you have a note delivered in consumer financing, a note secured by a mortgage on a home, a short-term note secured by a lien on a small business or some of its assets, a note evidencing a character loan to a bank customer, a short-term note secured by an assignment of accounts receivable, a note which simply formalizes an open account debt incurred in the ordinary course of business, such as a trade payable for office supplies. A note, and the last example, a note evidencing loans by commercial banks for current operations. So now we go to evidence of indebtedness under SRC, Section 3.1, letter A, fifth item. Evidence of indebtedness is just a generic and uh, catch-all term for debt securities. The point is that you can have a debt security by any other name and it would still be subject to SRC regulations. So an example is the case of Virata versus Nangui, GR number 2209262. July 5, 27. This involves a security called a sans recourse transaction or a without recourse transaction, which is documented through a confirmation advice. So in this investment arrangement, a corporation in need of funding goes to an intermediary, which will look for investors, and the intermediary enters into uh, sans recourse transactions where the investors expect to gain returns from the corporate borrower. The court held that the sans recourse transaction was a security. So the point is that the denomination or the name of the instrument does not matter. We need to look at the investment arrangement. So now let's go to asset-backed securities. The last item in SRC section 3.1 letter A. Okay, what time is it? Okay, 45 minutes na lang. Uh, and we're still in letter A, but we'll try to finish under, until letter G. So the SRC does not define an asset-backed security. And the way to understand it is to look at another law, the Securitization Act of 2004 or Republic Act Number 9267, supported by the implementing rules and regulations. Now, to understand the structure of asset-backed securities, we need to look at the bigger picture and context in which it is issued. So please refer to this chart. When you see a securitization transaction or securitization structure, uh, what you see is a securitization transaction. So securitization is the process of issuing asset-backed securities. Imagine that you are a bank that lends funds to different borrowers. Imagine that those funds are for the purpose of buying real estate. So we are talking about residential uh, mortgage loans. Now, when the bank enters into a residential mortgage loan as a lender, it will receive loan receivables in its books. These receivables are assets of the bank. The process of entering into that residential home um, or home mortgage loan is called origination. Origination is the transaction that gives rise to the receivables. So now the bank, the lender, is the originator. Now you know that the originator also has its own investors providing its funds. So the originator has issued certain securities in order to finance its business. It has secured financing from stockholders, from bondholders, and from other creditors. So now the originator is being financed by its investors and its creditors. And the originator has certain receivables 
which form part of its assets. Now, the creditors of the originator, uh, being bondholders, note holders, etc., have a claim against the assets of the originator. If the originator fails to pay its creditors, the recourse of creditors is to file, to file claims against assets for the satisfaction of the originator's obligations. Now, suppose that the originator wants to have more liquidity. Okay? Remember that the receivables are payable in the future. Let us say 30 years. That's the maximum of uh, home mortgage loan, 30 years. But the problem of the originator is that it can run out of liquidity. So one solution is factoring or discounting. You sell the receivables at discount to have a more liquid position. Now, another solution is more complicated. It's this chart that you're looking at. It's a securitization transaction. So instead of factoring or discounting, the originator will pull all of its receivables by transferring them to a special purpose vehicle or SPV. So the special purpose vehicle is another entity. Its creation is done at the instance of the originator. In other words, the originator is the sponsor of the SPV. They are related. The originator will transfer the receivables to the SPV. So now, the SPV holds a pool of assets, which is the pool of receivables originated by the originator. The SPV is now entitled to earn the returns on the receivables. If the borrowers pay their residential mortgage loans, the payment will go to the SPV. The pool of receivables becomes an asset of the SPV. And now the SPV will issue securities to investors. The securities issued by the SPV is what we call asset-backed securities. The returns on the asset-backed securities are ultimately obtained from the payments on the receivables that were transferred to the SPV. So now the investors of the asset-backed securities have a claim against the SPV's pool of receivables. Okay? The SPV does not have any other business except to hold the pool of receivables transferred from the originator and to pay the returns on the asset-backed securities. Now, why are we transferring the receivables from the originator to the SPV? What we are doing is actually ring-fencing the assets. So the, the word is ring-fencing. Uh, we are making a bankruptcy remote vehicle. Okay, suppose the originator goes bankrupt. If the originator goes bankrupt, the creditors of the originator will try to claim against the assets of the originator. But the creditors of the originator can no longer claim against the receivables. The receivables have already been transferred to the SPV. So it is the investors, the holders of the asset-backed securities, who now have a better claim against the pool of receivables. Okay, so now imagine if you are a creditor of the originator in a bankruptcy proceeding. Of course, you want to be paid back and you want to have some recourse against the pool of receivables. What is your possible argument? Your possible argument lies in the Financial Rehabilitation and Solvency Act, or FRIA. Number one, Substantive Consolidation Doctrine under Section 7 of the FRIA. Number two, Clawback Doctrine under Sections 52 and 58 of the FRIA, also called the Avoidance Powers. So under Substantive Consolidation Doctrine, the creditors can, act, can ask the Rehabilitation Court to commingle or aggregate the assets and liabilities of a debtor with those of a related enterprise. So there is a risk that the assets of the originator will be commingled with the assets of the SPV. This endangers the financial position of the investors of the asset-backed securities because the creditors of the original, of the originator now has a claim against the pool of receivables. Now, under clawback doctrine, the rehabilitation court may nullify the conveyance of the assets from the originator to the SPV. Creditors can claim that the transfer of receivables from the originator to the SPV is in fraud of creditors and is in violation of the priority of credits. So there's a risk that the court will nullify the sale of receivables to the SPV. Okay? So now, those are the possible arguments of the creditors, the substantive consolidation doctrine and the clawback doctrine under the FRIA. What is the defense of investors or holders of the asset-backed securities? Their defense is the Securitization Act of 2004. The Securitization Act recognizes and legitimizes securitization structures. So together with the IRR, it provides guidelines on how to structure a securitization in such a manner that there is a true sale of receivables from the originator to the SPV. 
So the Securitization Act permits the ring fencing of assets in the SPV. SPV becomes a legitimate bankruptcy remote vehicle. So through the Securitization Act, the creditors of the originator cannot claim against the pool of assets or the pool of receivables that have been transferred to the SPV. They cannot invoke substantive consolidation doctrine and they cannot invoke clawback doctrine or the avoidance powers under the free yeah. So ultimately, the Securitization Act protects the holders of the asset-backed securities. Okay, now another point about securitization transactions. Please look at the next chart. The pool of assets or receivables that is transferred to the SPV will have a particular return on investment. Now the SPV can create various classes of asset-backed securities. We call it different tranches. This is like your share classifications under the corporation code. But instead, you have different classifications of an asset-backed security. One is a senior tranche. This is the tranche that is first to be paid when the borrowers under those receivables pay the loans. The mezzanine tranche is next to be paid after the senior tranche. And the junior tranche is the last to be paid. The junior tranche actually assumes the most risk of non-payment or late payment from the borrowers under the receivables. The most junior tranche is what we call an equity tranche. Now, we should not mistake the equity tranche as a share of stock. I know it says equity, but it remains to be a debt security. It's called the equity tranche because there is a risk that you will not get your money back because you are, most, you are the most junior tranche. Now, a securitization plan needs to be approved by the SEC. Okay, finally, we are in section 3.1, letter B. Okay, letter B, investment contract. So this is the part where we discuss SEC versus Howey and the Howey test. An investment contract is a generic catch-all phrase intended to capture all unorthodox investment arrangements. You will not usually encounter an instrument with the title investment contract. The point here is that we need to look at the totality of facts if there is a security involved in the transaction. In SEC versus Howey, someone was trying to sell a piece, a piece of property. So the sale was documented through a contract of sale. Now, this appears to be an ordinary real estate transaction. You are just buying land. You are not investing in the enterprise of the seller. But in addition to the contract of sale, in this case, there is also a service contract. The service contract provides that the service provider will improve and develop the agricultural land that you bought. Again, the service contract appears to be a simple, ordinary service contract. It does not seem to involve an investment. You are just hiring a service provider to render services to you. So if you take the contract of sale of land in isolation, it's an ordinary real estate transaction. If you take the service contract in isolation, it's an ordinary sale of services. Now, what made the entire transaction weird is that the buyer of the land will never take possession of the property that he or she bought. The buyer can only enjoy the fruits or the returns on the property. Someone else, the seller and the service provider who are related enterprises, it's cultivating the land and remitting your share in the fruits or returns on the property. So in SEC versus Howey, the court said that the totality of the arrangement involved is a security. You need to examine the totality of facts and circumstances. You cannot conclude that a security exists or does not exist by virtue of the form, namely a real estate contract coupled with a service contract. So that is the origin of the Howey test. We have adopted the Howey test in SEC versus Prosperity.com Incorporated, GR number 164197 in the year 2015. So the elements of the Howey test as far as Philippine law is concerned is as follows. Number one, there is a contract, transaction, or scheme. Number two, there is an investment of money. Number three, the investment is made in a common enterprise. Number four, expectation of profits. And number five, uh, profits arising primarily from the efforts of others. Okay. So again, the Howey test is originally intended for unorthodox investment arrangements. And investment contracts are catch-all instruments representing any arrangement that qualifies as a security. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, now the next security under section, uh, SRC section 3.1b is certificates of interest or participation in a profit sharing agreement. This is another catch-all term for security instruments. If you notice, the name of this security just repeats the elements in the definition of a security in the first sentence of 3.1. But let me just briefly discuss the nature of an investor's participation. In an investment, you can either participate as an equity holder entitled to variable returns depending on the profitability of the company, or you can participate as a debt holder entitled to fixed rates of return. Now, the U.S. case of SEC versus Edwards, again, another U.S. case, which is only persuasive but not binding. In that case, it clarified that the returns of investment can both be fixed or variable. The fixed or variable nature of the returns of investment does not matter in the determination of whether an instrument is a security or not. So sabi ng court dito, mas importante yung distinction between investment context and commercial context rather than yung distinction ng fixed and variable returns. Okay. Next security is certificate of deposit for a future subscription. In a stock corporation, authorized capital represents the traded shares. They are created under the Articles of Incorporation. Subscribed capital represents the issued shares. They are issued through subscription agreements. Now, let us say that the corporate issuer wants to issue additional shares, but it has already maxed out its authorized capital. In other words, 100% of the authorized capital has already been subscribed to by investors. So in order to issue additional shares, it will apply for an increase in authorized capital stock with the SEC to create additional tranches of shares. Sorry. Okay, sorry. So while waiting for the creation of the shares, the investor already infuses the capital into the company, but take note that the additional shares cannot be issued yet because the additional shares are still pending. Creation and approval, uh, pending creation and approval by the SEC. So what will happen is that the capital infused by the investor will be booked as deposit for future subscription. The corporate issuer then issues a certificate of deposit for future subscription to evidence the capital infusion. Once the shares have been created, the additional shares can already be issued and the corporate issuer will convert the deposit for future subscription into subscribed capital stock representing issued shares. When the investor infuses the infuses deposit for future subscription, the deposit can be recognized as part of equity as long as it meets certain requirements under Financial Reporting Bulletin Number 6, dated April 3, 2012, which provides requirements of accounting recognition for deposit for future subscription as equity. The brief summary of this SEC issuance is that the application for increase in authorized capital stock has already been filed with the SEC. In short, nagaantay na lang yung investor uh, to, to have the SEC approval for the creation of the shares. Now, if you have the certificate of deposit for future subscription, you are not entitled to voting rights. You are not entitled to dividend rights because the shares have not yet been created, nor have they been issued. The next security is fractional and uh, fractional undivided interest in oil, gas, or other mineral rights. Philippine courts have not yet interpreted this instrument, so let us look for analogous principles in U.S. securities law. Interests in oil, gas, or other mineral rights are intangible rights. For example, a right to drill, a right to explore, or a right to develop areas with these natural resources. Now, when you see undivided interests, it implies there is a plurality of owners or holders of those intangible rights. For example, two co-owners having common interests in a single area with potential exploitable natural resources. Now, we only have used two jurisprudence on this. So we have uh, in Ballard and Cordell Corporation versus Solar and Danberg Exploration. 
the defendant selling his entire 50% interest in two oil wells did not sell a fractional interest and did not sell a security. So there were two co-owners, uh, each having 50% interest. One co-owner sold his entire 50% interest. So in that case, since he sold his entire 50% interest, there was no uh, fractional undivided interest. In Roe versus United States, the entire leasehold right was sold. So there was no sale of fractional interest because the entire interest was sold. In Darwin versus Jess Hickey uh, Oil Corporation, there's no security where plaintiff purchased all of the seller's interest and a fractional undivided interest was not conveyed. So the principle here is that the holders of the undivided interests must further split those intangible rights to different investors for it to be considered security. Okay. Now we go to derivatives. Um, the de definition of derivatives is in 2015 SRC rules, rule 3.1.9. Okay. So derivative is a financial instrument whose value changes in response to changes in a specified interest rate, security price, commodity price, foreign exchange rate, index of prices or rates, credit rating or credit index, or similar variable or underlying factor. In short, a derivative is an instrument, the value of which depends on the value of the underlying asset or reference variable, or simply the underlying uh, underlying, quote-unquote. So that's just one word. Now, when you look at the definition closely, you will see that it is very broad. It's too broad. Think about an instrument where you are sure that it is not a derivative. Okay? So imagine a security na sure ka, it's not a derivative. So let's say a unit of participation in a mutual fund. Uh, okay? No one in the finance world or investment world will say that a participation in a mutual fund is a derivative. And yet, the value of a unit of participation in a mutual fund, which we call the net asset value per unit or the NAFCO, is determined by the value of underlying assets, namely the weighted returns on the portfolio of assets being managed by the mutual fund manager. But clearly, it is not a derivative. So we have a problem with the definition. It is too broad. So if you, if you look at uh, finance textbooks or what is the market practice, uh, what is the understanding of the derivative? Uh, what makes a derivative unique is that it transforms the cash flow characteristics of an asset. It is capable of creating synthetic positions in an asset. When we say synthetic positions, it means it can create economic exposure without owning or holding the underlying asset. So it's like economic interest without ownership. A derivative can also transfer the risk return characteristics of an underlying from one party to another. So uh, that means that even if you don't hold a particular share of stock through a derivative contract, you can have economic interest or exposure in the price movements of that stock. Of that stock okay? Even if you do not own it or even if you do not have any intangible right intangible property right over that, uh, over that share of stock. So in the case of a mutual fund, it does not transform the cash flow characteristics of the portfolio of assets under management. It is just a pass-through instrument. The weighted returns on the portfolio of assets under management are just passed on or distributed to the holders of a unit of a mutual fund. It's just a pass-through instrument. It does not transform the cash flow characteristics in the portfolio. It does not create synthetic positions. It does not transfer the return profile of assets from one party to another. Yung, yung fund manager, the mutual fund, is really just passing the returns of the portfolio to you, minus management fees and charges. Now, okay. There are three major legal issues when we talk about the nature of derivatives. The gambling question, the insurance question, and the security question. So the gambling question is concerned with whether derivatives are gambling contracts. You have provisions in the civil code on gambling. 
Article 2018 of the Civil Code talks about contracts for difference, which is a form of derivative. So Article 2018 of the Civil Code actually talks about a non-deliverable forward contract. It talks about a situation where the parties are just simulating the sale of assets and they just want to speculate on the difference between the stipulated price and the market price. Now, the, the gambling question is outside our scope. For now, I think it is sufficient that Philippine laws and regulations recognize the legitimacy of derivatives. So, hindi naman siya as crude as a horse racing ticket. We have BSP regulations on licensing of financial institutions before they can deal with derivatives. The SRC itself mentions derivatives. The IRR of the Investment Company Act provides some guidelines on derivative exposures. And as I mentioned, there's a draft guidelines on derivatives which will uh, amend the IRR of the Investment Company Act. So take comfort in the fact that this is a gen is, this is generally valid, generally legal, generally enforceable since our laws and regulations recognize derivatives. So if you want to read more about the gambling question, you can read Onapal, Philippines, Commodities Incorporated versus Court of Appeals, GR number 9077. So 90707. The insurance question, on the other hand, is concerned about whether a derivative can be considered an insurance contract. When you look at a put option and a credit default swap, they can effectively function as insurance contracts. If you hold a put option, and the value of the underlying asset drops below the stipulated strike price, the counterparty can pay you the full strike price. If you hold a credit default swap and you, the debtor, uh, and the, the debtor defaults on his debt, the counterparty will pay you the amount of the principal. Uh, so there are some jurisdictions that are contemplating on whether this should be regulated insurance contracts. Okay. And now, the security question is about whether certain types of derivatives are considered securities. So there is yet no Philippine case law on this. But there are landmark cases in other jurisdictions that answer this question. So you can read up on the following cases. Procter & Gamble versus Bankers Trust. And the second one is Cayola versus Citibank. Okay. We cannot discuss the intricacies of this question for today. We will stick with an overview of the types of derivatives. So there are three basic types of derivatives. Forwards, swaps, and options. A forward is essentially a sales contract with a provision for future delivery of the underlying asset at a stipulated forward price. The buyer commits himself to pay the forward price the seller commits himself to deliver the underlying asset or in the alternative, pay the spot price. So the spot price is the prevailing market price of the underlying asset on the day of delivery. Okay? The parties can choose to have a physical settlement. In other words, the buyer can choose to receive the underlying asset. But in most cases, the parties choose cash settlement. In a cash settlement, the buyer and seller become mutual creditors and debtors of each other. So they will just offset the difference between the forward price and the spot price. If the spot price is less than the forward price, the buyer is the difference. If the spot price is higher than the forward price, the seller pays the difference. So cash settlement dispenses with the obligation to deliver the underlying Asset. And with that description, you will remember the Civil Code, Article 2018, and the case of Onapal. Okay? Forwards can be used for hedging. If you are an airline operator and you want to fix the cost of fuel in a 10-month period, you can enter into a forward contract and commit to a fixed forward price. The seller in the forward contract will assume the risk of fluctuation in the price of fuel. Now, the seller does not have to actually deliver you the fuel. You can buy the fuel from the market. But the seller will assume any fluctuation in the price so that you pay only so that you only pay the fixed forward price. This allows you to anticipate your costs. 
Futures contract is just another type of forward contract, but it is traded in an organized exchange and it has a standardized form. The trading of commodity futures contracts is currently suspended under SRC Section 11. Okay? So, habang ng discussion natin, suspended pala yung trading ng commodity futures contract. But take note that Section 11 only says commodity futures. It does not say forward contracts. It says commodity futures. Now, uh, the next type of derivative is a swap contract. Swap contract is a contract where two parties agree to exchange the streams of cash flow from their respective underlying assets. You are not changing any asset. I mean, you are not exchanging any asset. You are also not buying anything. You are saying that the interest on your security will be exchanged for the interest on another security. So one situation is where the holder of a floating rate note, so we discussed floating rate note a while ago, and the holder of a fixed rate note enter into a swap whereby the floating rate note holder will exchange the floating coupon rates for the fixed coupon rates from the other party and vice versa. This allows the floating rate note holder to better manage its interest rate risk. Another situation is one where one party holds a debt security in Philippine peso and the other holds a debt security in US dollars. Party A will pay the peso interests to party B, while party B will pay the dollar interests to party A. This allows the parties to manage their currency risk exposures. So you may ask, uh, will do naman ang structure ng transaction na ito. But in order to appreciate uh, this, uh, we look at the history of swap contract. It's actually it actually originated from back to back loans. So back to back loans, meaning to say that uh, you have a debtor and creditor, and they are both they are mutually lenders and borrowers of each other. And the amount of the loan is similar. It's the same. They own the amount of the loans in a back to back loan is uh, the same, except that they differ in terms of the interest rate or sometimes just the the currency denomination. So they will just exchange the difference in the interest rates or the difference in the value of the currency denominations. So back-to-back -back loans was the origin of the swap contract. Except in the case of a swap contract, the parties totally eliminate the entering into a loan. Okay. So uh, an option, okay, the next one is an option contract is a contract where the option holder has the right but not the obligation to, to buy or sell an underlying asset. An option with a right to buy is so a call option and an option with a right to sell is a put option. Let us assume we are talking about a call option. The holder of the option pays a premium to the grantor of the option for the privilege of having an option right. If the holder of the option wishes to exercise the option, it will simply pay the stipulated strike price or the price of the underlying asset stipulated in the option contract. If the holder exercises the option, the grantor will either deliver the underlying asset or in the alternative, the spot price of the underlying. So just like our discussion on forwards, the parties can choose physical settlement or cash settlement. In a physical settlement, there's equal de delivery of the underlying asset. In cash settlement, you offset the mutual credits of the holder and the grantor such that if the spot price is less than the, stop, the strike price, the holder pays the balance. If the spot price is less than the strike price, the grantor pays the balance. So now you already have an intuition uh, uh, why some people think that derivatives are like gambling contracts because of the mode of cash settlement. But in in reality, the fact that they, they can choose actual delivery, it means that the, the contract is not exactly simulated because they can choose to have an actual delivery of the underlying asset. So, okay, and a warrant, it's mentioned, I think, in 3.1, a warrant is a kind of option over shares of stock. So, we discussed earlier about embedded derivatives and standalone derivatives. A warrant is detachable. It can be traded in its own right. 
unlike an embedded derivative, let's say a conversion option in a convertible share. So that's that cannot be traded in its own right. Okay, and I promise that this is the last type of derivative that we will discuss. Uh, Another set of derivatives called credit derivatives. So an example is a credit default swap. In a credit default swap, there is a protection buyer. Maybe the protection buyer is a holder of debt security. The protection buyer pays the premium to the protection seller for the privilege of entering into the credit default swap. If the reference debt security does not default, the protection seller will not pay anything to the protection buyer. If the debt security defaults, the protection seller will assume the responsibility of paying the principal of the debt to the protection buyer. So that is why people think that it is like an insurance contract. Now, there is currently no organized exchange for the trading of derivatives, but derivatives are currently being issued and traded in the over-the-counter markets. So we're done. We're done with derivatives. Okay. So we go to certificates of assignment. Actually, when you say certificates of assignment, it's also a debt security, like a bond or a note. And you may ask, what is being assigned? What is being assigned under a certificate of assignment is the collateral. So you have a concept in Philippine case law called assignment by way of security. So uh, there is an assignment of the collateral for the purpose of guaranteeing the obligation. So it's not as simple as entering into a loan contract. The borrower owns certain assets and it will assign those assets as collateral to the lender. But it's just a secure, I mean, it's a, there are two concepts of security. It's not the security in SRC. It's the security device under the civil code. So they're assign, assigning the collateral as a security device under the civil code. So uh, And when the borrower repays the loan, there is a repurchase of the collateral upon repayment. Okay. So now we go into certificates of participation. It's very broad, but uh, I think one example of what certificates of participation mean is a unit of participation in a loan agreement. So you can find an example in this case of Abacus Capital Investment Corporation versus Tabuhara, GR number 197624, July 23, 2018. So this transaction, this case talks about a money market placement through an intermediary. So if you read this case, you need to uh, you need to supplement your reading of this case with Virata versus Namwi because the the transactions are similar. There is an intermediary. The intermediary is uh, looking for investors on behalf of the corporate borrowers. Okay, so. So the investors have a unit of participation in the loan agreement but, uh, entered into by the corporate borrower. Okay, so that's it for certificates of participation. We go now into trust certificates. Actually, when you look at the, the U.S. securities uh, law, the complete name is collateral trust certificate. So the complete name is collateral trust certificate. It's the opposite of a debenture. A debenture is an unsecured bond, but a trust certificate is a secured bond. So it's a secured bond where the issuer deposits the collateral with a trustee in favor of the bond holders. So yun lang, yun lang yung point doon. It's, it is secured by a collateral. The next one is voting trust certificates. Okay, and I think you are very familiar with this in the revised corporation code. But just to summarize, there is a corporate issuer that uh, issues the shares of stock to the stockholder. The stockholder transfers the shares of stock to a trustee 
and the trustee issues the voting trust certificate to the stockholder. And the purpose of uh, this transaction is for the trustee to exercise the voting rights in the corporation. On the other hand, the stockholder only enjoys the economic rights. So voting trust certificate is a way to decouple, to decouple or to unbundle control rights from economic rights. Okay, and if you want to review on voting trust certificates, the relevant provision in the revised corporation code is section 58. Okay, section 58. So, malapit na tayo matapos. So, now we go to proprietary or non-proprietary membership certificates in corporations. Proprietary shares are, an, are evidence of interest or participation of or privilege in a corporation which not only entitles the holder to enjoy the use of a specific property but also the dividends or earnings of a company. Okay? So not only can you enjoy the property of the issuer, but you can also enjoy dividends or the earnings of the company. On the other hand, non-proprietary shares are evidence of interest or privilege over a certain property of a corporation in view of the amount paid by the holder for the said certificate. So it's just, it just gives you, if you hold non-proprietary shares, it gives you the right to use the properties of the corporate issuer or it gives you certain benefits as a member of that non-stock corporation, but it does not give you the benefit of participating in the distribution of earnings of the issuer. So an example of membership certificates are club shares and timeshares. Okay, club shares and timeshares. So now we're in the last item in SRC section 3.1. Okay, so let me just cite some examples. Uh, we mentioned earlier that this list is open-ended. So this item is intended for other innovative securities that you will not find in that list in section 3.1. So, uh, so one example is crowdfunding instruments. So crowdfunding instruments. So we have SEC issuances on this the rules and regulations governing crowdfunding under SEC Memorandum Circular Number 14-19, July 8, 2019. So that's Circular 14-19. Another, another innovative security that was uh, recognized recently is virtual currencies. Okay, but... but uh, I must mention that you need to apply the elements of a security in section 3.1. It doesn't mean that all virtual currencies are securities. You must still have an investment context. So when, when someone asks, is Bitcoin a security? The, the facts are not complete. You need, to, you need to ask further what is the context in which uh, this Bitcoin is being issued. Is there an investment in a common enterprise? Is there a, a participation in the profits of the issuer? And so on. Okay, so there is an SEC advisory uh, which recognizes the possibility that virtual currencies can be securities. So the title is Public Participation in Initial Coin Offering and Purchasing of the Virtual Currency. The SEC advisory, it's dated 2018. There is also an administrative case before the SEC dealing with this question. So it, that's in black. That's about black cell technology, black cell technology incorporated. SEC CDO case number one dash eighteen dash forty six, January 2018. So in that case, uh, it still or the SEC still applied the elements of a security, and in fact, it used the Howey test to determine where the whether the virtual currency or the cryptocurrency involved in that case. Uh, it's a security. Okay. Pre-need plans. Okay, there is a provision in the SRC mentioning pre-need plans. That's section 3.9. It says that pre-need plans are contracts which provide for the 
performance of future services or the payment of future monetary considerations at the time of actual need for which plan holders pay in cash or installment at stated prices with or without interest or insurance coverage and includes life, pension, education, interments, and other plans which the SEC may from time to time provide. So, bakit na-mention yung pre plans do sa Section 3.9? In SEC Opinion Number 54-19, November 25, 2019, the opinion actually says that uh, pre plans are or can be types of securities. So, we have an SEC opinion on that. Okay? So, another type of security not mentioned in the, in the list under SRC Section 3.1 is uh, mutual funds and other collective investment schemes. So that's governed by Investment Company Act. Okay, and so I think that is the last one. We have also the Real Estate Investment Trust Act of 2009 or Republic Act number 9856. So your participation in a real estate investment trust is also a new type of security. So that actually ends our uh, discussion. Okay, and, and maybe I, I, I will try to answer some questions that we have. Okay, let me just uh, check uh, what are the questions. Okay, so uh, I'm, be, I'm being asked to expound on the nature of pandemic bonds or uh, as I mentioned, COVID-19 bonds. I, I think I mentioned this in the beginning. So actually, pandemic bonds are just ordinary bonds, okay? So if you're the government, you can issue government securities in the form of treasury bills, treasury notes, and etc. So those can be either short-term or long-term. So a pandemic bond is just a bond where the purpose of the proceeds will be used for pandemic responses. So it doesn't really uh, vary or it doesn't modify the nature of the bond in terms of cash flow structure. Uh, there is still an investment uh, on the part of the holders of the bond, except that uh, the purpose of the proceeds or the purpose of the use of the proceeds will go into uh, pandemic responses. Okay, and this is similar to green bonds, social bonds, and Islamic bonds. So I think there are SEC memorandum circulars on that. And the, if you read those uh, memorandum circular, circulars, they actually uh, provide guidelines on how to make sure that the proceeds of those uh, green bonds, social bonds, and Islamic bonds will, will be for the purpose that, uh, that were stipulated in the bond indenture. So a pandemic bond is just like that. Uh, the, the purpose is different, but the structure is similar to other types of bonds. And I think another question is, what are the financing options schools may avail at this time to help them ease the financial burdens that the pandemic has caused their respective schools? So, well, on top of my mind, Generally, you, you, you have equity and debt. So equity stands for shares of stock and uh, debt securities stand for all the other types of securities we discussed earlier that are based on obligations. So you have bonds, notes, uh, and, other, uh, and, and other various uh, kinds of certificates. Uh, but it's also possible for a school to finance its uh, needs through bilateral loans, like getting a loan from the bank. So in that sense, getting a loan from a bank, it's bilateral, it's not necessary, it's not a security, okay? Because obviously there is no investment context involved. As we discussed in when, when we were talking about notes under the family resemblance test, 
when you get a loan from the bank in order to finance your operations, there is no investment context involved. It's a commercial context. And that's not a security. But yes, it's an option uh, for schools uh, to address their funding needs during the pandemic. Okay, so... <laughs> Okay, what are possible bar questions regarding securities? Okay, take note that the only thing that we discussed this morning is the nature of securities and the process of public offering. So the most common bar exam question is the security identification problem. So just memorize the elements of the security and just memorize the Howey test, okay? All right, so, so yun lang yung technique for the security identification problem. Of course, ang dami nating sinabi kanina, ang dami uh, family resemblance test, investment context versus commercial context, but those are just persuasive, persuasive authorities. What we have adapted so far is the Howey test, okay? Yung uh, SEC versus prosperity.com, that's very important. So, so you keep that in mind when uh, reviewing for the bar exam. Another bar exam question is the procedure for registration of the securities. So it's simple. You just file the registration statement with the SEC and then you publish the notice of the filing of the registration statement and then you wait for the order of registration or the declaration of the effectivity of the registration statement. So you need the registration of the security in order to in order to distribute and sell your securities to the public uh, within the Philippines, okay? Uh, and related to that, we did not discuss it anymore kasi ang haba na ng list ng SRC 3.1, but there is another list uh, that is commonly asked in the bar exam. That's the list of exempt securities and the list of exempt transactions. So you, you study that, you memorize that list because that can be asked. Those are lists of exemptions, uh, exemptions from the registration requirement, okay? Uh, another fact pattern asked in the bar and which is out of the scope of our discussion this morning is insider trading, market manipulation, various investment frauds, and proxy solicitation and tender offer, okay? So let me just repeat, that's insider trading, proxy solicitation, uh, in investment fraud, market manipulation, and tender offer. Okay? Okay, um, sorry, pahabo lang. When you read the syllabus for the bar examination for commercial law under the Securities Regulation Code, I noticed that there is an item there on option, option trading. In the SRC, there is a provision on option trading. But do not be confused with the provision on the suspension of commodity futures trading with option trading because the SRC does not say that option trading is suspended under Philippine under, under Philippines. It only says that uh, the members of the exchange are not allowed to guarantee the performance of an option. Okay, so it's not a prohibition on the regulation on the trading of options. Uh, this is unlike. Uh, the provision on commodity futures contracts where you are not allowed to trade uh, commodity futures unless sinabi ng SEC. So pag sinabi ng SEC, pwede na magkaroon ng commodity futures trading, then that's the time that uh, you allow commodity futures trading. Okay, I think that's the last question. And uh, with that, I end my lecture. And uh, thank you for listening. Kung may nakinig man. <laughs> Okay, so good luck for the bar exam and good luck for your uh, class in securities law or corporation law. Okay, so I will now sign out.